speaking with Camille Barbagello from the COP26 Coalition. Uh, the COP26 Coalition is a UK-based civil society coalition of groups and individuals who will be mobilising around climate justice during the upcoming COP26 meeting. Um, this coalition is organising the upcoming People's Summit for Climate Justice, which will be taking place from November 7 to 10. Uh, and in addition, uh, there's also a Global Day of Action that has been set for November 6 that will uh, involve groups taking action around Britain, but also uh, around the world. So firstly, welcome Camille, and thanks so much for speaking to Green Left. Thank you. It's uh, good to be speaking to you again. I think it's been about 25 years since I did an interview with Green Left Weekly. <laughs> well, it was probably not with me then, in that, if that was the case. <laughs> but yeah, look, it's great to have you here. And just firstly, could you tell us a little bit about how the COP26 coalition came together? Certainly. Um, as pro listeners will probably know, uh, the Global Climate Talks, which is the Conference of Parties, uh, which is convened by the UN, moves around the world um, each year. There's been a lot of pressure um, for it to move to countries in the global south. But nonetheless, uh, here we are with it um, happening in the UK. Um, and so what normally happens is that civil society in its kind of broadest kind of uh, kind of articulation, so trade unions and grassroots organizations and also NGOs and faith groups uh, come together um, because they play an important role uh, in the COP process, both as observers um, and delegates inside of uh, the blue and green zones, but also on the outside. Um, and the COP26 coalition um, is under the leadership of folk who've been engaging in the um, COP process for over 20 years um, and who have been working in solidarity with um, movements predominantly from the global south, but also indigenous movements and frontline communities across the world, um, who've been arguing for um, uh, system change uh, and the necessary kinds of system change that we need to see. Um, and have really been pushing for a climate justice um, framework to really kind of frame um, how we need to think about solutions and also how we need to think about the problems that we're facing. Um, and the coalition uh, is a UK based, uh, sorry, British and Northern Ireland based uh, coalition uh, that uh, involves all of the organizations and groups that I just mentioned in terms of the wide spectrum of civil society um, and is really, interested in using this process uh, to further the politics and the aims of uh, climate justice and at the same time uh, has undertaken to do movement building um, and using this opportunity to obviously build public pressure on uh, nations that will be gathered uh, at the COP but also to build our power um, on the streets uh, and together in terms of our strategies uh, and our solutions that we're proposing um, in uh, the People's Summit as well. Thanks Camille and can you just I know you're still finalizing the program for the People's Summit so it's, it's probably a bit of a premature question but if you are able to could you just maybe outline for us some of the highlights of the People's Summit? Yeah um, so I'm pretty proud of uh, the People's Summit. For those who have been following the COP26 coalition uh, for the last 18 months you'll know that the postponement of COP um, happened last year as a result of the global pandemic. Um, and so we've already hosted um, two global gatherings. We did them online in November of last year and um, April of this year. So the People Summit really continues a lot of the conversations that we've already been having um, digitally. Uh, we had 8,000 people register for the global gathering last year. Um, and so the People Summit this year, um, is being organized uh, in a, with a hybrid format uh, in recognition of the severe um, inequity and unevenness uh, and barriers that predominantly people from the global south, um, who happen to be all of the countries on the red list um, of the UK immigration uh, rules, are having in accessing the COP26 processes. So, uh, you know, an underfunded uh, and not very well resourced coalition like ourselves is um, able to really think about inclusivity in a way that the UK government seemingly can't get their head around. 
Uh, and so we are offering both an in-person event uh, in Glasgow, which will be happening across 13 venues uh, to increase and enhance our COVID safety. Um, and it, we will also be conducting a digital program. So listeners in Australia, um, who I don't think you can leave the country yet, can you? Um, uh, will be able to tune in to the digital program uh, and, uh, and there will be, you know, everything that people understand that the left like to do, you know, panels and workshops uh, and trainings. Um, and uh, I think that one of the most important aspects of the People's Summit is the bringing together of different movements to sit around the same table and discuss things from um, and really listen to each other um, and listen to what is happening in different communities around the world. What we know is that the climate crisis is here uh, well and truly. This is in Australia. I obviously don't need to explain that too, given the um, fires uh, and droughts and every other ecological disaster that is um, unfolding on the Australian continent as we speak. Um, and so the People's Summit brings a certain urgency uh, to both our discussions um, in terms of we obviously need to accelerate um, our campaigning and our organizing efforts. Uh, and But in doing so, we need to make sure that we really center justice. Um, there's no point in racing ahead and ending up with authoritarian um, which are usually quite racist uh, solutions in how we manage uh, both the crisis now and also the crisis in the future. That's very, yeah, very interesting, actually. I mean, you're right in terms of the situation in Australia, we feel that we're both at the forefront of the climate change reality, but also one of the countries contributing the most to it, <laughs> to climate change. So, um, which is why I think this event is so important and why I think audiences and activists in Australia really need to participate in any way they can. So uh, it's good to hear that, you know, in a sense, the COVID reality will actually perhaps make this more of a global event than um, if it was just limited to face-to-face -to -face participation. So that provides a great opportunity for activists here. Yeah, it's about the only thing that I think is good that's come out of uh, the global pandemic <clears throat> is that I don't think that we have any excuse anymore not to build, to, but we have to build an international movement. Uh, global, we have a global problem. You can't solve the climate crisis in one country. You can definitely start to work on uh, how different, you know, national economies and production processes are contributing. Uh, and I would wholeheartedly agree that Australia punches above its weight uh, in emissions um, and in uh, lifestyle choices uh, around, uh, you know, a whole variety of really carbon rich uh, kind of uh, choices. But obviously, we don't need people to make individual lifestyle um, changes. We need uh, the, the government of Australia and the corporations of Australia to disinvest from fossil fuels, and we need them to do it immediately. Um, and there are many campaigns in Australia at the moment that are on the forefront of uh, trying to stop fossil fuel extraction. Um, and I would, you know, hope to see a lot of those discussions from the Pacific region um, happening at uh, both in Australia, but also at the People's Summit as well. Um, and also I would hope to see people taking to the streets on November the 6th uh, in terms of um, it, we have to, like, as I said before, global problems require global solutions um, and we cannot leave uh, coordination and cooperation to um, the leaders of nation states, especially when your leader is someone like Scott Morrison or, um, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, or, you know, previously Donald Trump, though Biden's, you know, hardly that much better. Um, and so uh, in that way, I think that the COP really throws a light on uh, the role of social movements and also our responsibility. Now is not the time <laughs> to leave uh, these questions up to governments who have a vested interest uh, in fossil capital capitalism. Um, and we have to break the kind of connections between how people make money and huge amounts of money uh, and extractivist methods. Um, and I think Australia and the Australian left has a really important role to play um, in that debate and that discussion and also keeping a shitload of uh, fossil fuels in the ground because mm. otherwise 
it's really bad for everyone else. I think a lot of us are sort of feeling like, you know, this COP is, if you like, our last, a bit of a last chance for governments to actually come forward with the sorts of, um, you know, commitments to emissions cuts that are needed. Um, I mean, you know, especially given the IPCC's latest reports, um, including the leaked reports and the worsening emergency. I mean, do you, you know, do you, Think, does, the, does the coalition think that anything is going to come out of this COP in terms of the kinds of commitments coming from governments, from nation states that are actually needed to guarantee a safe climate? Yeah, so I think it's important to have a think about how we think about time and urgency and emergency. Um, I'd really caution against the kind of feeling that this is that time is running out or this is our last chance, because I think we need to be realistic that we've blown through all of our last chances. The last chances were decades ago uh, in terms of stopping climate change. We're now um, locked into some pretty catastrophic levels of uh, global warming uh, and the earth is getting hotter and that's going to have um, effects. In saying that, that doesn't mean that it's game over. <laughs> it's, a, it's the difference between whether or not it's disastrous or whether or not it's cat catastrophic. Um, and you're right, the leaked IPCC um, information shows that if we were to follow all of the commitments that are currently on the table, we would be locked into a three degree world, a three degree warmer world. Um, which is an absolute disaster for Australia. Like it, that's not that's not a livable um, scenario for the vast majority of people in Australia, nor um, communities in uh, just north of Australia in terms of around the equator. So uh, we have a really complex, I think, situation to deal with. We have to uh, maintain some level of hope. Um, and I think that hope comes through building solidarity and understanding how powerful we really are. Um, we can't wait for governments to act. Uh, we've been waiting for governments to act for decades now. Um, and what they've demonstrated is that uh, the, um, the desire for money and for profit uh, and for wealth uh, far outstrips seemingly <laughs> um, the self-interest of uh, staying alive on a livable and habitable planet. planet. So um, I can't remember who said it, but it's easier to imagine the end of the world at the moment than it is the end of capitalism, right? Uh, so that I think ends up feeling quite demoralizing actually. And what we know about um, how environmentalists and you know, I think we need to put ourselves in that category in terms of I'm not blaming other people have uh, talked about climate change for the last kind of decade has often used a kind of tick tock, tick tock TikTok kind of um, uh, uh, discourse or narrative around we basically we've been trying to scare people into caring about things that really affect them and what we know about scaring people is that it usually leads them to support quite reactionary solutions and so we need to be really careful we are genuinely in a very serious crisis and one that's about to that is very bad for many people around the world and I Again, I reiterate, I'm not trying to tell people how bad things are. I know the kind of horror and uh, terror that it has rained down on very many communities in Australia over the last couple of years. Um, but it's going to get worse um, and before it gets better. Uh, and what we do now definitely matters. So it's even though we've blown through uh, those, um, a lot of those last, last chances, uh, it still matters what we do now. Uh, and we really have 10 years uh, to, make the, to make massive transformations in how we produce energy uh, and how we consume energy. Um, and, sh and, and the energy regime is, is deeply connected to modes of accumulation um, and forms of production and ways in which capitalism um, organizes. What I would say um, is that global capital and finance uh, is already transitioning, right? So the idea that they're dinosaurs that are, you know, still drunk uh, on the power and, and profits of fossil fuels, A, is very true, but they're dinosaurs that are um, also very, uh, have a high degree of self-interest. <laughs> uh, and they are, um, they are already transitioning. Now, we know what happens when workers are not in control of transitioning uh, economies out um, 
here in Britain. Uh, the famous miners' strike of the 80s is a classic example um, of when governments and industry uh, are in control of decommissioning industries. And we know all across the north of England, we can see the effects of what happens around abandonment and neglect of working class communities who are just thrown on the scrap heap. So what we need is a worker-led transition. Uh, and quite frankly, we can start doing that now. We don't have to wait for governments because it's us that take the, um, the fossil fuels out of the ground. It's us that uh, manufacture them and it's us that transport them around the world. So the working class quite literally can produce very quickly the change that we need. And we need to go back to some of the excellent history in Australia, you know, I'm sure when people talk about climate change in Australia that they can't not talk about the Builders Labourers Federation of the 1970s, who understood very clearly that working class people have an immense amount of power to create change outside of their, their um, wages and conditions. And it's that kind of confidence, it's that kind of clarity, and that kind of ability to act and willingness to act that we need to see happening in Australia and across the global north at a frightening scale, because there are literally millions and millions of people in the global south who are already struggling, already fighting, and are waiting, basically, <laughs> for movements uh, that uh, in the global north to catch up uh, and to start acting uh, with a degree of coordination that means that we might just get out of this uh, without it being an absolute catastrophe. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're aiming for. Um, I guess the, the last thing I wanted to just ask you to comment on, I suppose, is a little bit more about this whole question of fundamental system change that needs to take place. I mean, as you say, you know, we don't we don't have to wait for governments to um, to, to talk about and organise around a just transition. Um, but I guess every, uh, everything we do now. Um, in that direction points towards a very different kind of future, one where, you know, the levers are in the hands of working people and not uh, big capital. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, especially given that the, this, the leaked IPCC report, you know, is, is basically making a pretty clear case for why um, capitalism is, uh, you know, inconsistent with... Uh, securing a safe climate and that we need system-wide change if we're going to actually avoid catastrophic climate change. Um, so to me, this is the exciting bit, right? Um, this is where the hope lies. Uh, and this is why I actually think that uh, it's not just out of a kind of, um, it's not just up against doom and gloom and kind of dragging our bodies through this kind of last kind of act or last moment on stage kind of thing. This is our moment, right? Like, and the left has to seize it. Like, we're not going to get another chance at this point because we have to fundamentally change the binary between work and nature. Um, and I would throw care um, into that mix. Uh, so those three concepts, and I would start with work. Um, work fundamentally changes uh, in a worker-led transition. Now, what do I mean by work? I don't just mean uh, blokes who work in fossil fuel industries by any stretch of the imagination. I mean that everybody's work has to change because everybody's relationship uh, to the more than human world uh, and to uh, re-centering a completely different ethic around care and justice in our lives. Um, and so, uh, we need massive investment uh, and support for and revaluing of the work that traditionally women have done and migrants and people of colour. They've usually done it in an unpaid capacity. Um, since the 1970s, in places like Australia and in Britain and in the, U in the US, we've dragged a huge amount of working class women out of uh, unwaged work and into waged work. And that's really changed a whole variety of ways in which the capitalist system works. Uh, and it's really accelerated uh, the climate crisis in a whole variety of really complex and, uh, and quite interesting ways, actually. So work changes, everyone's work changes, um, and we get a hell of a lot more time uh, to do other activities that we have been told are backward and boring and feudal and peasant-like. Um, and 
it means that our lives actually change. It means that we have a relationship with the food uh, that we are going to consume and eat and produce. Uh, it means that we have a relationship to our energy production. Uh, that means that we don't just uh, think that there's an unlimited and unbounded amount um, of, uh, of resources for us just to plunder and exploit. And it means that we get to reimagine what progress means, right? And it's not a linear um, idea where we're somehow hurtling towards some, you know, quite frankly, horrific dystopian world where robots do everything um, and uh, we all just get to sit around with our iPhones constantly staring into social media for the rest of our lives. Um, so that's the, that's the exciting part, right? Like that's uh, where the revolutionary ideas come from. That's where we get to discuss with communities, indigenous communities who've, who have managed to maintain and hold on to uh, previous ideas that they had before colonization uh, and imperialism came and disrupted um, so much of, of people's ways to life. And it means that we have to acknowledge that lots of ideas that we thought were really sacred <laughs> um, and, a real, and a part of um, modernity, things like freedom and rational men uh, and all of those things actually need to be rethought, right? So our relationship with the more than human world has to be transformed. And we have to stop thinking of ourselves as separate uh, from the world in which we live and are dependent on. And I would respectfully suggest that what learning from indigenous communities and rethinking about how we do not own the world, but we are custodians uh, and we are moving through it and we have to take care of it in the same way as we have to take care of ourselves and those in our communities um, offers a much brighter future uh, than some kind of green capitalist dystopian uh, world where um, we're fracking and geoengineering and, you know, I've heard things like asteroid mining and a whole variety of other things that just seem completely bonkers to me um, and also, you know, obviously horrifying when it all goes really wrong. Nuclear um, would be the other, um, you know, answer that a huge amount of people desperately trying, you know, I often think about that it's people want to change as little as possible so that as much as what happens at the moment can stay the same. And I say bollocks to that. This is our opportunity to change everything, right? Um, and, it, and it is fantastic that quite middle of the road scientists, liberals in a whole variety of different institutions actually are waking up to the fact that capitalism is not only unsustainable uh, for the people that have for centuries uh, been churned through its production processes uh, and killed and maimed and harmed, but that, our, that it's simply not sustainable any longer. But I would say that it's not a foregone conclusion of what happens after fossil capitalism, right? And so we've got to be in it to win it, which means that we have to build social movements that are strong enough to be able to intervene into the changes that are coming. Um, and so the COP26 offers an opportunity to try to start that conversation or connect conversations that are already beginning. This is not the beginning of these campaigns by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a degree of urgency um, that I think many, many more people uh, are becoming aware of uh, and are you know, um, they've been told for the last kind of 20 years that they just need to stop using plastic bags and change their light bulbs, right? Um, and then that somehow connects to mega firestorms, you know? Um, so I think that it's right that people are a bit disorientated and confused uh, because the messaging uh, and, the th and the way in which people have tried to take hold of this problem and make it individual, make it an individual contribution is a complete misdirection. And it's a misdirection on purpose by capital to distract us um, and make us think that if we just lead more ethical lives on an individual level, then somehow uh, we will morally not be responsible for climate change. And I think we need to turn that on its head and understand that there are a huge amount of men, basically, and a couple of women, uh, making a huge amount of money out of this crisis. Uh, and those, and we need to focus on that um, and uh, invest in, um, a, in, in a global movement that is rooted in local struggles. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Camille, for uh, speaking to Green Left. And... Uh, we hope we can catch up with you again, actually, before the People's Summit happens. Um, but uh, we just yeah, wish you all the best for organising over the coming months. 
thank you very much. Uh, and I hope to see some really kick-ass demonstrations happening in Australia on November the 6th. See you later, everyone. Thanks.